Hey everybody, it's Ripley again, and we're going to talk about trig properties today and sort of button up this uh, last lesson. Let's make sure I am where I want to be with those. Okay, so again, we're talking about the trigonometric properties. We're pulling off of the unit circle. We're getting all of our values. Um, all of our points x, y come from x squared plus y squared equals 1, which makes it nice. We've got our mnemonic, all students take calculus. All of the trigs are positive in the first quadrant. Sine and cosecant are positive in the second quadrant. Tangent and cotangent are positive in the third quadrant. And cosine and secant are positive in the fourth quadrant. All right, so let's make sure we define everything that we got here. So I've got sine of theta, which we know is the y value. I've got cosine of theta, which we know is the x value. And then I have tangent of theta, which we know is y over x. And then I've got cosecant theta. Which is, which is 1 over y, secant theta, which is 1 over x, and then cotan of theta, which is x over y. Now, you're probably already seeing an identity that we can use here. I'm going to give you a whole bunch of properties and identities that you can do, use down the road. And the first is that cos secant of theta is 1 over y, and y is sine theta, so this is, we could write this as 1 over sine of theta. They are reciprocals of one another, which we've already discussed. We know that secant of theta is 1 over x, and cosine of theta is x, so this is 1 over cos. And then last but not least, cotan of theta is x on y, which is tan of theta is y over x, so I know that this is 1 over, oops, sorry about that. I know that this is 1 over tangent of theta. 1 over cotangent of theta would be madness. So this is 1 over tangent of theta. All right, so those are the first identities of this group right here. Anytime that I want to get away from cosecant, secant, or cotan, I can get away from them and get immediately to sine, cos, and tan. And the coolest thing about that is what it really says is that um, si really all that you need is sine of theta and cosine of theta. Oh, let's hit one more identity. I know that tangent of theta is y over x, and y is sine, and x is cos, so another way of saying tangent of theta is sine of theta over cosine of theta. And there we go. We got some fantastic identities that we can work from. These, by the way, are called the reciprocal identities. Reciprocal identities. All right. All right. So we got everything. Now, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, let's think about this from the theta standpoint. All right. I want to know if I can. I want to know the relationship before between the cosine of theta and the cosine of negative theta. So if I'm doing the cosine of theta and the cosine of negative theta, well, let's draw ourselves just a quick little, quick, quick little unit circle to work from over here. Do you agree that if I come out here to theta, and I have some point x? comma y versus if I come out here negative theta so this is going to be negative theta then I'll be at the point x comma negative y now what do you notice here well if I go theta for any value I'm just staying in the first quadrant to make first and fourth quadrant excuse me to make it easy but for any theta and negative theta notice that the x value doesn't change sign even if I'm in the, the second and the fourth quadrant even though the x will be negative the value of the x won't change, which implies that cosine of theta is equal to negative cosine of theta. Now, we're going to talk about what that means in terms of the graph of cosine here shortly. But look closely. If theta is positive, then I have the point x comma y. If theta is negative, then I have the point x comma negative y. See how that works? Again, even if we end up in the second and the third quadrant versus the first and the fourth, I end up with exactly the same property, which implies that the sine of theta is equal to negative the sine of, whoops, let's try that again. Sorry. Try that one more time. I know that the sine of negative theta is equal to the negative sine of theta. Last but not least, let's talk about the tangent of negative theta. What does that thing do? 
Well, I know by the reciprocal, or excuse me, by definition, tangent of theta is sine theta over cos theta. So this is sine of negative theta. Holy smokes. I don't know where that came from. Sorry, guys. Need to grab some lunch, evidently. This is equal to the sine of negative theta over the cosine of negative theta. And since we know that sine of negative theta is negative sine of theta, this is negative sine of theta divided by cosine of theta, because we know that cos of negative theta equals cos theta. So this is negative sine of theta over cos theta, which is negative tangent of theta. Now, let's think real quick. This gets kind of fun. If I think of my functions, now I'm going to replace my thetas with x's, and let's watch what happens. If I think of f of x as cosine of x, well, by these properties up here, watch what happens. This implies that negative, or excuse me, f of negative x equals cosine of negative x, but because we know that cosine of negative theta is cosine of theta, that implies that I have cosine of x. Now, hopefully you remember from back in your days of graph theory in Algebra 2, that implies that the graph of cosine is even. This even if f of negative x equals f of x. This implies an even function. Now, we can look at the graph. Oops, even function. We can look at the graph of cosine over here and watch what happens. Whoa, where's my floater? Right, here we go. Remember what the graph of cosine looked like? The mother graph? It looks like that, but if I continue that, it looks like that. And look, you've got that y-axis symmetry that we all know that we know all even functions have. It's symmetric across the y-axis. All right, that's cool. Let's look at uh, f of x equals sine of x. Well, that implies that f of negative x equals sine of negative x, which equals negative sine of x. Well, again, if you remember from Algebra 2, if f of negative x equals negative f of x, this implies we have an odd function, which is easy to tell from the mother graph. Here comes my mother graph. All right, that's the one you're supposed to memorize, but look. And look at what I get. Odd symmetry implies origin symmetry, which means for every point up here, we get a point down here. For every point over here, we get a point over there. So guess what? We've got some new and wonderful information. Look at f of x equals the tangent of x. Well, the exact same thing happens. Watch. f of negative x equals uh, tangent of negative x, which we know from over here. Where are we? Over here. That tangent is going to be negative tan of x, which implies the tangent is also odd. Again, let's carve out just a little sliver over here. We don't need much. Think of what tan looks like. Yeah, looks like that, and then it looks like that, and then it looks like that, which clearly has that origin symmetry. All right, let's go ahead and look at some more properties. Let me kick over here. Let me give myself a unit circle to play with. Drawing unit circles on this thing is not easy, I'm not going to lie to you. All right. All right, x squared plus y squared equals 1. All right, how about this? How often does sine repeat itself? Let's look at sine of theta. Well, I'm a fan of looking at the function. If we instead think of f of x equals whoops, sine of x, and we know that that guy looks like that. We know that this repeats itself every 2 pi. So I know that the sine of theta, any angle, plus 2 pi, again, we're talking about radians here, which would be 360 degrees, but I've been talking about radians um, quite a bit. Hopefully you're starting to get pretty fluent with radian speak, as it were, is always equal to sine of theta. So basically what we do is when we add 2 pi to it, we just get the same thing back every single time. If that's a multiple of 2 pi, same thing back. Again, look at the cosine of theta. 
Well, cosine of theta, let's look at the function now. If f of x equals cosine of x, well, we know what that guy looks like. It looks like this, but then it repeats itself on both sides every 2 pi, which implies that the cosine of theta plus 2 pi is equal to the cosine of theta. Now, because they repeat themselves in both directions, both sine and cosine repeat themselves in, in both directions, I can actually say plus or minus 2 pi. That's powerful good news. All right, well, let's look at the tangent of theta. But again, ignore the tangent. Let's look at the function. If we look at the functions first, we have this visual record of what these things look like. This one's a little different. Remember our tangent? Here's tangent, but it repeated itself. Remember how this was negative pi halves and pi halves. Notice its period is pi before it starts to repeat itself again. So this would be from pi halves to 3 pi halves. And then it repeats itself. It repeats itself over here. This is negative 3 pi halves. So I know that the tangent of theta plus pi this time is equal to the tangent of theta. Isn't that cool? And that talks to us about the periodicity, not only of the function, but of the points that we're grabbing off of the unit circle. All right? I'm a real visual learner. You could apply that if you needed to to the unit circle and think about why if I start at zero, it takes me a full lap around the circle before I start repeating values of both sine and cos. But with tan, remember, all students take calculus. I start in the first quadrant and tan starts to repeat itself because remember this is these are negative values of x and y versus positive values of x and y. It only takes pi to get to repeated values of tangent, which is a really powerful thing.